you made it. You're halfway at the 50 most relevant. Today, the number 25, St Kilda's inspirational leader, Jack Steele. For years, he's been one of the best scorers across all formats of the game. And last year, a few things didn't go his way, and he certainly didn't deliver on the expectations we had. But is that a sign of things to come? Or is he about to rebound hard in 2024? We're going to unpack that on today's episode of the 50 Most Relevant. Hey, it's MJ from the Coaches Panel. I hope you're well. I trust you are enjoying this series of every single day. We are having conversations about who I think are the most relevant players to have conversations about for fantasy, for Dream Team, and for Supercoach. Joining me on this episode, as he has for big chunks of this preseason already, he's a regular part of the Coaches Panel. You also hear him on the Pod Pod and the Keeper League from time to time. It's Louis. Hello, mate. How are you? Good morning, mate. Yes, I'm well. How are you? I'm doing well. Look, Jack Steele's an interesting guy for us to get into. If we deep dive just for a moment into his 2023 season, we see that disappointment that I kind of alluded to. We start to see that unpacked a little bit for us there. A seasonal average of 94.7, just the seven tons in super coach. Despite that, still a top score for us of 160 and a 167 is his career high score. So despite the disappointment, the guy was still giving us games that was right at the top of his scoring tree. He's priced just under 530K in that format. While in AFL Fantasy and Dream Team, a seasonal average of 97.8 with 10 tons, a top score of 146, a career high score of 162, and in Fantasy and Dream Team, a nine. $903,100 $903,100 price tag, while he's just a touch over $880,000 in AFL fantasy. Louis, for a number of years now, ever since Jack Steele took his game to that new level where he's always been a defensive beast. Tackles have always been a staple part of not just his game, but his scoring build. And over the past couple of years, he's just added uncontested and contested marks. He's added contested possessions to his uncontested possessions. And he's become one of the most rounded footballers for us in the fantasy footy community. And then just a few things didn't go his way last year. We'll look into the numbers in a little bit more depth in a moment, but that collarbone injury early in the year, an ankle clean out of some surgery post-season, it's safe to say it was a really unfortunate and unlucky year for Jack Steele and mostly for his owners that owned him last year. Yeah, big time, mate. And this was probably the first time that we've seen Jack Steele not be able to uh, put together quite a few games in a season. So... Obviously, started his career at the Giants, where he showed quite a bit, and uh, a lot of fantasy coaches sort of fell in love with him early, and then uh, moved over to the Saints and established that floor of tackling, which we always knew he had, but I think that really bought favour with the coaches and got that responsibility in the midfield, and he's been able to build on that, as you said. He fills up all the stat lines now. He's now captain of the football club, Uh, and even though we do talk about injury, it's it's interesting. He only, uh, sorry, rather he played 20 games. So he only mm-hmm. missed three games of football. Uh, but in this season, he's actually sustained three injuries and kept playing. So uh, that explains why we're talking about him today, why he is so relevant, probably more than what he would be had he kept chugging along at, along at that 110 average, MJ. Yeah. So last year, if you look at his season in blocks, it gives you some interesting dynamics. You can look at a couple of those early parts of the year and be like, oh, there's 60s in here. There's 80s in here. These are these are un-Jack Steele-esque sort of numbers. And then you look in other blocks, like between round 17 to 20. Over this four-week stretch, he goes at 125 in AFL Fantasy and 128 in Supercoach. He goes at 104 across the formats in his final eight games of the year. And in that final that St Kilda played and lost, he goes 114 in AFL Fantasy and a 130 in Supercoach. So I think that's where it became so frustrating to own last year and so hard to jump off him in a trade outside of when he injured his collarbone was it was, I saw it for a week and then I didn't. I saw it for two or three weeks and then something dynamically changes. And he was miles off in contrast to what, he, what he'd done. You mentioned these past few seasons. One of the safest 110 guys we've got going around did 120 back the season before last as well. And so we've got this guy. We know what he is. We know on his day, 
one of the most rounded scorers we've got going around. Got one of the best fantasy ceilings for midfielders we have going around and consistent scoring tons that most weeks against most opponents, you can put the VC and the C on and feel really pretty comfortable about how it's left it. So how you view Jack Steele is there's a potential of 10, 20, 25 points per game of upside based on what he's previously done to what he finds us priced at. But, Louis, I'm keen on this. There's a weird division in the fantasy community at the moment around Jack Steele. There are portions that are bullish that this is one of the easier selections of the year. And there are portions of the community that are equally as bullish of going, I think these mega scoring days are behind them. Both sides in the community feel really, really valid in their narrative that they've got a correct read on it. Where do you see this landing? Because it does feel a little bit to me that it largely depends on Saints game style and his injury of the year. How you interpret those elements of 2023 probably do inform how you're viewing him this early days of 2024. Yeah, look, MJ, I'll be honest. I'm quite high on Jack still. I have noticed the division and, uh, Look, I don't want to assume, but I just wonder if maybe some coaches think he is going off the hill, over the hill. He's only 28 years old. He's he's actually younger than what I thought he actually was. So uh, there's also a bit of a stigma where when you get burnt by a player the year previous, you you tend not to go back. You you learn from your lesson, but uh, we we got to think differently. Each season, you've got to select on its own merit and... This year, if you just look at the black and white of it, you've got a player who went at 110 in 2022, that went at 98 in 2023, and of course, we can select him at that price in 2024. So what we need to work out is whether he's got the potential to go up, whether this is more of the norm, or you know, worst case scenario, does he regress from here? We'll find out in the season proper, but I think we can make a pretty solid case for Uh, This guy improving uh, in 2024 because, like you said, uh, he did have those injuries. So to to start off, he had a a collarbone. He only missed four weeks, MJ. And (laughs) as we said in the Simpkin episode a couple of weeks ago, continuity really affects form in football. Uh, He just wasn't able to get a good run at it. Maybe he comes back from that collarbone. He's a little bit, oh, I don't want to tackle. I don't don't want to put myself in the contest, risk it, uh, potentially blow this injury out a little bit. Comes back, plays some okay football, but definitely uh, underwhelming from a fantasy perspective. Even the casual coach could notice that. Then he has a bit of a knee issue. He's dealing with that all year. Uh, Achilles soreness as well. So misses some games through that throughout the year. And it just makes it really difficult to string multiple games of football together uh, where you're playing a consistent role in the team. Uh, but what what I sort of took out of this as a positive, though, MJ, when looking at the CBA mix of the Saints is mm. Ross really didn't let him up. Uh, he went at 76% CBAs that whole time, which suggests to me that even when his uh, prize player, his role as Royce in that midfield is injured a little bit down on form, uh, what have you, that he is seriously keen to still have him in that midfield around the ball uh, which is a testament to to what he brings and hopefully something that we can rest on uh, as what the role will be in 2024. This Saints midfield is fascinating to me, and I want to unpack that in a moment, but you mentioned this weird yo-yo of scoring that first game he comes back from injury. Okay, looks a little bit tentative, just the five tackles for Steele, which is really unlike him. A week later, He's back up at 11 and he goes 120 plus across the formats. You're right. When your body isn't allowing you to do what you A, know you can do, um, but B, the game style and structure around you wants of you, then it's really, really hard. Last year, St Kilda were the number one team for disposals uh, and for AFL fantasy points, leading up there in marks as well. They, They just had so much ball and it wasn't a lion's share for any one person. Now, we probably at some point last year owned a Jack Sinclair and the Zaya Wanganine Miller, certainly an AFL fantasy and dream team at the back half of the year. We've gone back to back to back now days of Saints. So clearly we've clumped them all together. And if you haven't picked up this thread, then certainly you should now. I can't see this changing. You don't, as a new coach, come into a system coach one way 
and then radically move on from that the next way. You do the hard work in the first season, ingraining a style of play that you want to see this team play. Yes, there's finesse and minutia and details that change, but overarching, what we saw St Kilda do in 2023, I'm really quite confident they do in 2024, which is hold on to the ball, get heavy possession opportunities, take plenty of marks, move the ball well. It's not this surging press that we've seen from a Collingwood, a Richmond, a a GWS. It is ball retention and ball movement, which has been heavy for what we know Ross Lyon does. Talk to me about this midfield mix because it's evolved even further from last year though, Louis, because for so many years, Steele's been the main man. He's carried the midfield and put them on his back. Crouch has been there for a number of seasons and and he's reliable. Um, Hill, outside player. Henry, outside player. Sinclair, bit of everything, really. Your jack of all trades, as we spoke about on the most recent episode with Rids. But I'm curious on how these players, in your eyes, may or may not impact the volume of opportunities for Steele to get the ceiling games, I suppose, is what we're looking at, because I agree he's the main man. Paddy Dow. Is he just depth or is he best 22? Marcus Windhager, if you're picking teams based on preseason rigs and he's your captain and your vice captain, Mitch Owens, uh, Matthias Philippou, and then you've even got the old guard of a Hunter Clark and a Seb Ross. So how do you see this midfield mix lining up for us this year? Because I agree, he's the number one guy, but does it clip some of his ceiling for us based on what he's done previously? Honestly, MJ, I'm not sure it does. Uh, maybe he loses a couple of tackles here and there, but there's all the potential uh, based on, you know, we see Dow apply a lot of pressure in that midfield from Carlton, uh, but th- that might result in a couple of kicks, a couple of handballs here and there as well. We're not asking this guy to shoot the lights out priced at 98. Uh, we're just hoping that this guy can get a couple of extra tackles, a couple of get extra touches, which we've already built a narrative for why he can uh, to get to that 105 upside, which I think in AF would probably be enough uh, as a starting pick. What does that represent? Eight, nine points value, which is which is happy days when you're selecting from that spot. Uh, the Saints, they're going to be predictable. Um, that's because of Ross Lyon. Uh, he, he's a predictable coach. He's very set in his ways. And why wouldn't you be? He came into this side brought them to finals in their first year after how many uh, years away from finals and a lot of disappointment from the fans. So Mm. I think he'll keep building on that. I think that Jack Steele and Brad Crouch being those main guys in that centre bounce, like I said, is encouraging. I think those uh, that final spot in that midfield or the final two spots where they rotate will be a heavy rotation. So we look at last year, we got Seb Ross who... When at 54%, he's getting up there in age now and maybe isn't even best 22. So we'll see where that lands. Hunter Clark, that could go up, that could go down. A lot a lot remains to be seen there. Zach Jones, a little bit of the same, but uh, you'd think you're probably going to move on from a Zach Jones in that midfield. So Gresham's gone. Sinclair, probably better off halfback. So yeah, we're really looking at these young guys. Uh, Philippou, Owens, Windhager, uh, Paddy Dow is still quite young as well. So uh, they're, they're still going to need the big bodies in there, the the mature mm. ages to rely on that have a bit of a cooler head, uh, know what to do in the more intense moments of a football game. And I think Ross Lyon really respects that. We've seen that quite often he'll give large roles, a lot of responsibility to his older players in his team. And there's a reason for that. And look, let's be honest, it, it does work for him. Yeah, structurally, he could be really important for you as we navigate these early buy rounds and we know that people are looking at, can I get a midfield or a defensive premium? Can I find a way to squeeze in one of these big guys who, if they didn't have a buy, it would be an absolute no-brainer on picking them. But now that they're there, it's a difficult conversation. Does Steele help you with that? Not just because he plays all the way through those opening six weeks of the year, but with his vice-captaincy potential, depending on the match, up and a captaincy potential as a safety net if you're confident that he can score like we saw in patches last year in this Ross Lyon system well now he becomes a pathway to open up a bunch of different things for you and, and that again adds this new layer of why people are interested equally people are going is a 105 enough do I want a 105 is do I want more from that can I get an 85 guy 
like a Carl Amon in AFL Fantasy, up to a 105 guy, save that 100,000 because I'm happy with other elements of my structure. Will I happily trade into steel? What do I need to see in the preseason? And, and that's probably the before we look at a, one last thing before we hit drafts is for those that are a little cool might be unfair, but at the moment don't have steel in their side. What would change their mind to see in the preseason? What, what would be like pennies dropped? I've, I've got to change my perspective. I've got to get off being cool on steel to, I have to find a way to get him in. What, what would you be encouraging coaches to look and see? And if it happens, jump on. A great question, MJ, because um, I think it's pretty predictable what we're going to see. So I, I, I'm not sure how coaches are going to spin that. I think he's had a really good preseason so far. He's leading all the time trials, which you love to see. So come the practice games in the JLT series or whatever sponsors sponsoring it these days, if you see him in the guts there attending most centre bounces and just looking just looking good. You pass the eye test. There's still a lot of room in this game for the eye test. Then I think you've got to spin yourself a, at least a good narrative not to pick him from there because all the all the ducks are in a row at that point. And when you've seen a guy that's gone 120, 110, uh, and even previous to that has, uh, I think he's put up two 110 seasons, hasn't he, mate? Yeah, 120s across so, the format he's done before, yeah. Yeah, so, you, you know, you don't want to rest too much on previous scoring, but with put up a pretty good uh, narrative here on why this guy has regressed this season. I think uh, if he can return to basically what he was doing before, which is what he did in 2023 anyway, it was only really injuries that curtailed him. Uh, then all of a sudden he, he has to be super relevant, which is why he's here, but he has to be in high consideration to be selected in that midfield as we move more towards a value game. So in his last eight games last year, he went at a 104. Is that enough for you to get you to where you want? If you're happy with that, you look at the early buys, you look at the potential that Louis's done a really great job through this episode of unpacking for us about what he has been and a narrative pathway of why the season was overall a little underwhelming, then he does become a really easy selection. Equally, you might be structuring your team in a way that you've got a bunch of these guys through this price point. For example, in AFL Fantasy, there's Took, there's LDU, Josh Kelly, got him on the podcast, Zach Butters, Sam Walsh, all within around 20,000 of each other. It becomes then how many of this bunch can you start? Is two, two at a limit? Is three a limit? Can you go deep on four and go, I'll hope for value, value, value? This is where it starts to become, oh, yeah, Steel's great and he'll go 105. But if you're bullish on LDU, going 110. If you can see Zach Butters going 110, if you can see Sam Walsh going a 108, now all of a sudden, again, this is just AFL fantasy for a moment, you start to go, okay, I won't go steal because I want X, I want Y, I want Z, and unfortunately I can't get him in. I suppose the positive for us is, Louis, for those that start him, that aren't happy with the start, let's forecast that. With AFL Fantasy's two trades a week and now Supercoach and Dream Team with 40 trades available across the season, the pathway of if you don't see what you expect from someone early days, you can very, very easily make that narrative move. Hit that trade on the premise you've got your value players right at the lower end. You can move off steel relatively easy. There's a bunch of parachutes that we just listed for listeners there. Yeah, there is, mate. And I think he might be priced at the topper end of all those players that you just mentioned. So potentially there's a world where you do just drop down. You're also pretty close to being able to just go up to a premium if they're there. Quite often in AFL Fantasy, we see that after the first one, two, three rounds, there's somebody that is just not on the radar, full stop, that pops. Uh, last year, look, he was on the radar a little bit. It was a Will Setterfield, Jack Zebel. Probably most coaches thought he was over the hill, but if you jumped on early, it was happy days. Uh, and and these players that are about 200K less than him can often present uh, almost, well, definitely more value than these players if they pop off because the magic number start, is so high, but the break even goes a lot lower than these other players. So uh, he also gives you that opportunity to pivot as well because if he is only going at a 98, but you can select someone 
150 to 200k cheaper that's going at an 88 to a 95 uh then there's your pivot point too but that being said i think in comparison to those other players you can build a stronger um story for jack still being able to return to the mountain to do it again uh whereas with some of those other guys you're you're really building a story to okay if this happens, if these two, three things happen, if he gets the role in the midfield, then yes, he can go 110. Whereas I think we've uh, built a pretty strong narrative to say, well, Jack still, he's doing it already. Uh, he just needs the body to not let him down. And then potentially, yes, he can go back to that 110. It's about just removing as many variables as you can, I think. And, and looking over Jack's career, Injury hasn't been synonymous with him either. So I, I think yeah. you can, do you put 2023 as a unicorn year where everything went against him? You can do that. You can also look at it and go, there's enough little things that I'm not sure about and I'm happy to use a trade to trade into him and maybe not start him. Okay. That, that can work for you too. That's the beauty of all of these games is there's never one specific thing when it comes to starting squads that must be done at this upper echelon rather it's about the trades and the moves you make during the season that ultimately determine the direction and the successes of your season or not when it comes to drafts your common coach which you are not if you're listening and watching to this episode you are far from that but the common coach in your draft league is probably just drafting off seasonal data from the year before and a little bit of preseason hype in the fantasy footy communities. Those two things are probably the greatest indicators, and probably the third would be their AFL club's bias that they have of the team they support, are the greatest three things that make people make decisions on draft day. On potential and on history, Jack Steele could be your M1. But you don't have to pick him there. You could get him, and it won't happen in every draft, but definitely in Supercoach, it wouldn't shock me to see him drop off the board regularly as an M3. I think it could be an M2 more likely than not in AFL Fantasy. But there's there are some drafts where people just draft off average and they don't just scroll down that little bit further and see a guy that has historically gone 110 or people that are very much like in the classic format, cooling on him and would rather get the LDU or the Butters types over him. So I reckon common spot is M2 in AF and M3 in Supercoach would be a dream, but I think it might be more closer to reality than I think we care to admit. Where do you see him going on draft day, Louis? Is that M2 spot about right? Or do you have to jump early if you really want to get him? No, I think M2, M3 is about right. There's a lot of new kids on the block from 2023 that have really just excelled in maybe what even we thought they could potentially do. So we're talking like an Errol Goulden, Zach Butters, Connor Rosie, how even a Jai Newcomb is is starting to make a bit of noise. So um, there's all these guys that are on the way up and I think there's a bit of a stigma than Jack, that Jack Steele is on the way down. So because of that, I think you'll be able to get him outside of the first round. Uh, towards that M2 location. And uh, if you do have a few people that are dirty on him in your league, and like you said, maybe that's coupled with a couple that just draft based on average, then I can definitely see a world where you might be able to get Jack Steele at M3. And in which case, happy days. Oh, that's the greatest M3 you're ever going to draft uh, if Jack Steele is that. Louis, you're a star as always, mate. Thanks for being on this episode. Uh, thank you for having me, mate. If you want to go and check out the article that sits alongside this episode talking about Jack Steele, it's available for you now at coachespanel.tv. The audio podcast is also available. And wherever you get your audio podcast, you can go and find, just simply search for the Coaches Panel and make sure you've subscribed and followed along. And if you haven't already, leave a five-star rating and review. It's one of those quick 10 second things you can do that actually makes a really big impact and does show some practical support for the coaches panel. If you leave a little comment and a review, we might even read it out on one of these episodes of the 50 most relevant. And we're broadcasting all across YouTube as well with new videos dropping every single day in the preseason. If you're watching this, Comment below and let us know what you think about Jack Steele. What do you think he's going to average in 2024? Make sure you subscribe to the channel, got those notifications on. So as soon as we go live with any single video, you will be notified straight away. In a minute, 
I've got a clue for you about who's coming up tomorrow in the 50 most relevant. But if you haven't joined our Patreon supporter group, you know what? You're missing out. There's a bunch of great additional rewards, including for our breakout and premium tier levels. They're getting these audio podcasts a day early in the preseason. There's plenty of stuff they get season proper and preseason as well, but that's one of the big rewards of why people are just wanting to get in early to get ahead of the pack on the 50 most relevant. And there's a bunch of other tiers that you can get involved in as well. If you want to subscribe and become a part of that supporter group, all the details are in the description of this episode. So tomorrow, who's up in the 50 most relevant? Great question. Our guest, Tim Mitchell, one of the guys behind the scenes with Supercoach. We're talking to him and talking about a player that portions of the community see him as the number one defender. There are portions of the community that only see radical regression But I think if we're all honest, when the price is right, you are jumping all over this guy. Which premium defender are we going to talk about tomorrow? You'll find out in just a few hours.